Over the past few years, unfortunately, we've all heard the stories of organizations of all sizes being attacked with a cybersecurity threat of one kind or another. As I said, no one's immune. So as I was kind of looking into that subject, I, I recently came across this, a concept called zero trust. New to me, but I don't think new to a lot of people, but it's something discussed in the cybersecurity world. And so to learn more, I turn to Pam Kubiatowski, CTO and residence at Zscaler to help me learn more about zero trust, the current state of cybersecurity, and maybe even give us a couple of ideas of what we can do to begin protecting our companies, employees, and industries we work in. Pam has over 25 years of experience in IT and has witnessed and engaged in technical transformations and has guided global IT organizations through change. In Pam's previous role as a director of global network service and data centers, she championed the network transformation program that touched over 1,100 locations in over 135 countries. Welcome to Keeping the Lights On. I'm your host, Todd Reed. And on this podcast, I connect with the owners and pros who design, build, and maintain our electrical, communications, and industrial world to explore the best ways forward. Let's go spend some time with Pam Kubiatowski and learn more about Zero Trust. Um, well, so, you know, the part of the point of this show is to, because we deal with people in all kind of different, like, uh, industrial verticals and all that. And we, everyone works together, but we're not necessarily talking. So one of the things I, I wanted to do with this show is to bring people together from different areas to just share kind of broad ideas and challenges so that we can all learn from each other. And so one, one way people do that is like, if I brought a few listeners uh, to you, to your you know hometown or wherever, you would probably take us out to eat somewhere, right? Because you, you bond over food and meals, that seems, and drink, uh, seems to be the way people bond together from different backgrounds, right? Because we could, we all need to eat. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to start out each episode, Pam, with, um, if, I, if we were to visit you, uh, where, where might you take us? Okay, so you're going to chuckle, but we have to make a detour first before we go to the restaurant. Because, oh, okay. Okay, because I live in Chicago, and there are phenomenal restaurants in Chicago. But I'm actually going to go ahead and we're going to jump in the truck. We're going to drive to the southwest side of Chicago and we're going to grab an Abby's pizza. It is mm. one of the best pizzas in Chicagoland. And it's a little storefront place. It's been there, I think, since like 1967, 69. The same oven is still there. Mm. So we're going to grab a pizza. Now, I do have paper plates in my truck. Don't laugh, but I do. Because once you actually get the pizza in the car, you can't stand it but to have some. And we're going to use that as an appetizer because we are actually going to drive four hours north to the north woods of oh, wow. northern Wisconsin. And there I have a cabin in Tomahawk and there's a restaurant called Silver Birch. Okay. And right now they actually have an igloo up. They put an igloo up on their deck overlooking the frozen lake. It's just beautiful. And we're going to go ahead and I'm going to take you to north woods and, and you're going to experience a north woods supper club in Wisconsin. Wow. That's you know, kind of crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. You don't hear about supper clubs much. There's a few around here, but uh, so what uh, is it? What's the name of it? The supper club? It's called Silver Birch. Okay. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, what What's your favorite? What would you get there? Um, your standard thing to get there? I actually love their ribeye and they make homemade deviled eggs to mm. die. Mm. So the deviled eggs come with your salad. And so sometimes they'll go ahead if they have a slower night. And if you get there at the right time, I'll be like, hey, can we have a couple extra deviled eggs? And they're like, ah, no problem. You know, throw a little on a plate. And yeah, it's yeah. really wonderful. Yeah, nice. Is there um, a drink or dessert you like to to get there? You know, okay. So being in Wisconsin, Northwoods, everybody has the old fashions. I just don't do old fashions. Mm. Just give me a whiskey press. Right. So a CC press and actually most people are like a press. What is that? It was actually created in Wisconsin and I grew up in Chicago. Right. But a press is part seven up, part club soda. So it mm. kind of cuts the seven up, the sweetness of it all. So that's what I have. Well, I, I do want to get to that pizza place for sure. And four hours we'd be hungry again. So that's a it's, it's, it's <laughs> that's perfect. what I mean, the pizza. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got to have it for that ride. So they, that's a great answer. Um so, you know, I we, we chat a little bit before we meet here for the interview, and I did a little look in, uh, at Silver Birch, and it looks amazing, of course. I mean, gosh, you don't even need to eat there. You just look at the scenery, and that, they can get filled on that, which is pretty cool. But mm -hmm. so it's a it's a small business, really. You know, it's they've been there for a long time, and yeah. um, 
but even even them, I don't know how much they think about it, but at some point they've thought about cybersecurity at some level. You know, I'm, I'm almost guaranteed. Similar to companies like ours, Fortune 500 companies. Um, and like that and like us, our listeners range in size and, you know, industry they're in and market, but cybersecurity is on all their minds, again, to one level or another. And it's, and again, as I started looking into it, it's such a huge topic. I mean, it's hard to say, what's one thing I can, you know, one thing I can do, but we're going to try to narrow it down a little bit. And I just kind of want to understand your perspective on as how you and what do you, when you come to this topic, how you view things. So um, you are on the user side and, you know, looking to protect the interest of your company. And now you're at a company, you know, focused on helping companies protect their interests. So can you share kind of what you did briefly before you worked with Zscaler? Sure. So I actually was formerly the head of global network services and data centers for a multinational um, healthcare and medical device company. Um, my former organization is in about over 160 countries in the world. And so we actually started our journey of transforming and changing and thinking about security differently about seven and a half years ago when we had a major division actually spin off of the enterprise. And when that happened, things started changing. We started looking at hybrid cloud strategy. We started going ahead and moving more and more to SaaS solutions. And our users, they weren't being secure properly off premise. It's one thing to be on premise at a facility, right? Where you're going through security stacks and, and you're doing the best you can to secure end users off premise, but they have a really different experience off premise than on premise. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, when you come on premise, you don't think about how to get to something or to an application or internet destination. You just click it and you get to it if you're allowed to go to it. So that's kind of where we were um, in the past. So you've, um, can, you, can you tell me about a time and uh, we'd want to try to keep the show fairly clean. Can you tell me about a time and, you know, as general or specific as you want, that oh, sh uh, oh crap moment? <laughs> um, every time a vendor sent out an alert and saying, mm. hey, we have a situation or others, or you see in the news, someone was hit with some sort of malware or phishing email. Or for that matter, we experienced it ourselves. We once had a situation where our CEO, a number of individuals got an email from our CEO. Now this group of individuals, and this is how crazy this is, this same group of individuals typically would get an email from our CEO and in it would have a link to a government website. And they would click the link and they would do what they needed to do. Well, unbeknownst to those users, that actual website was hacked. So when they clicked that website, they went to a, when they clicked it and they were in that website, it was actually malicious and it had been hacked. And when they clicked, it started downloading things to them. It's, it's those sorts of things that I could, I, we could talk for hours about the oh crap moments, mm -hmm. but you know, people talk about, well, end users should know better. How, how would you ever know that? As an end user, you would never know that that website was actually hacked. Mm -hmm. That's where user education and also technology has to protect your organizations. It has to be a mix. That's interesting. That's a that, that's interesting you brought up that situation because I was just reading something about kind of on the personal level, someone saying that how'd this work? She got an alert on one of her credit banking apps or whatever, mm -hmm. investment areas. So she went and did some looking and then she called the service or the company and he said, Yeah, I got an email from you asking me for information and she was like i never sent you that information so that that's just that that's wild i mean this was not a that could, anyway that it's, it shows you just all the different ways that it's creative and uh, a fun time for everybody else. well but todd to that point i mean there isn't a day that goes by my personal email not my work email my personal email i will get notices hey your tiktok password has expired click here to mm -hmm. read Right. Or, you know, uh, I've gotten Microsoft emails saying, hey, you're you're for my personal Office 365 account. Yeah. Your actual credentials are expiring. Click here. There isn't a day goes by that I get some sort of malicious emails, phishing emails sent to me personally. It, it's about my education, actually, personally, in, a, in addition to my organization to protect myself. Yeah, yeah that's pretty crazy. So, um <clears throat> 
I am curious now, so you're not with the company, now you're with a different company. And I'm curious, what is a Zscaler? <laughs> and what do you do there? And what do they do? And what do you do there? Yeah, no, absolutely. So Zscaler was founded um, by our CEO. He had a vision about 15 years ago. It was founded in 2007. And he realized, and this is what was crazy when I actually met him as, as a customer, right? I was, we were a prospect. We met with him and it blew my mind because what he realized 15 years ago was that organizations were going to start moving actually to service-based solutions such mm. as you know SaaS applications. They were going to start to think about more moving more and more off-premise in their data centers to clouds, right? Like the AWSs, the Azures, the Google clouds. And that the technology had to be flexible enough to protect them irrelevant to where your user or your applications actually were. And with that, Zscaler has become the world's largest security cloud and leader in zero trust digital transformation because ultimately Zscaler was built in the cloud. It was not about a traditional hardware company modifying and becoming virtual to secure in this manner. We actually were built from the ground up in cloud. Wow. Interesting. Okay. You know, I appreciate you. That, that helped me uh, understand what their, you know, their, their purpose in the cybersecurity side of things. So that's cool. Um, what are, what are kind of the top three to five, however number you want to cover mm -hmm. uh, areas that are attracting the attention of the, you know, the, the cybersecurity world and people like you and Zscaler? So if you look at Zscaler it being the world's largest security cloud, we see, and this number is crazy, but we see over 320 billion transactions a day. Now, this is 20 times what Google does for searches on a daily basis, okay? Because of the amount of data we're able to see and understand, we actually are part of a group, an alliance. There's about 40 or so organizations, and we actually monitor the World Wide Web. And when you're monitoring the, wide, the World Wide Web, you're looking for malicious activities, behaviors, what's happening, right? What are people facing with? And so when you look at 2023, and it's really key to talk about 23 going into 24, because 23 was the boom of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. right? Um, in, additions, in addition, CISOs were being held responsible in 2023 for not properly securing their organization, their company data, and their customers. So when you look at all of that, when you, and you go into 2024, we're, here we are, we're looking at an increase in actual ransomware attacks via AI. And if you're seeing an increase in attacks via AI, then why wouldn't you use AI to fight AI, right? So we are, we, are, we are working with that with many organizations, like I talked about with the 40 of us monitoring the World Wide Web. You know, when you look at artificial intelligence, AI, it will empower threat actors to automate diverse tasks at, at scale. And with that, identify exposed assets like firewalls and VPNs in order to basically effortlessly compile lists of vulnerabilities or crafting sophisticated phishing emails they're going to use against you. Now, some people talk about VPNs are like, oh, you know, we're fine, we're fine. But when you look at a VPN, VPNs in a tr on a traditional network, they're exposed to the internet. Think about this, somebody sitting on the internet just listening and saying, hey, I'm here, I'm here, anybody need me, anybody want me? That's what these VPNs do on the internet for your organizations. It's sitting, waiting for you to connect to it. It becomes an exposed target. And that's where bad actors will actually, they can link to that VPN. And if they have an exposure, they'll use the exposure to then get into a network and can move laterally. Mm -hmm. Another interesting one we see again is ransomware as a service, which kind of sounds crazy. But innovation and insisting in the volume of successful, successful attacks is going to be the actual ransomware as a service. Because what ransomware is going to do as a service is it's actually going to elevate cybercrime and empower less skilled cyber groups in their attacks because someone's going to help them do that. I mean, doesn't that sound crazy? 
you know, we, it just blows my mind, right? And ultimately, the SEC, the regulations that we saw in 2023 are going to drive far more active participation of board members and CFOs for reducing cyber risk in organizations in 2024. So a lot going on. But when you look at it, AI is really part of 2024 mm. and the criminals. Um, can, a couple of clarification questions. You said, I think I know what it is, but just make sure CISO. Mm -hmm. What is that? So CISO is the Chief Information Security Officer okay. in a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so can you just a little bit more, obviously we don't get too deep in that because again, all these topics we could spend hours on. Yeah. The SEC and the board, what, what, what's, what are you talking about there? I'm not really quite clear what. So what in 2023, uh, it actually was December, December's timeframe of mm -hmm. 2023, the SEC put a mandate in place that organizations will have to be able to file with the SEC material breaches, meaning if an organization had a malicious actor, had been breached in some manner, they are going to have to go ahead and determine what does the breach mean and file it with the SEC so that the SEC understands who has been, who has been violated out there. So it's just kind of like a repository of these that someone can look up and. They can, but the problem is, is that for some of the large organizations, let's use solar winds, for example, and, and some of you may have seen solar winds in the news, the, the actual CISO, the chief information security officer, who his role is or her role is to define security, cybersecurity within large organizations. That, or, that actual SolarWinds breach that happened that affected many, many, many of their customers, the CISO was actually personally held liable in addition to SolarWinds. Wow. That's where a lot of these CISOs are getting nervous and looking at security differently and saying, we need to take an active role in assuring our security is what it should be. Because they're actually going to have to go back to the SEC and account for it. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about zero trust and how it plays in this, you know, our topic that we're talking about today? Sure. So in a zero trust architecture, all users, devices, applications are inherently untrusted and cannot freely communicate with each other. It's a different concept, right? So when you look at it, connectivity in a zero trust architecture is brokered as needed based on business policies, identity, and context. So what does that really mean? Let me give you an example. In a traditional network architecture that we've all done for the last 20, 30 years, what, what happens is, uh, let's just say, Todd, I come to your office and I actually come to the receptionist and the receptionist, I give maybe a driver's license to say, this is, I'm Pam Kubiatowski. And they say, okay, here's your badge. And you're gonna meet with Todd in room 12 on the third floor, okay. So I basically just go and as I'm going to the third floor in room 12, I see all these open rooms. I see all these open desks. I see mm -hmm. desks that have all sorts of information out on it because maybe that individual went to lunch. So I'm going to walk in any room I want to walk in. I'm going to take pictures of whatever I want to take, right? And then maybe I meet you at room 12 on the third floor and maybe I don't. I turn around, I go back to the receptionist, give you back the badge you gave me, the receptionist, and then I walk out with your data. OK, it, that is a traditional network architecture. You basically trust everyone and any, everything who is on your network. In a zero trust architecture, you're not trusting anyone or anything. So now, same example, I come to your office. I give them my actual license. They look at it. They say, Pam Kubitowski. OK, they now escort me to the third floor, room 12. And as they escort me, Every door is closed. I see nothing except a hallway. When I get to room 12, I sit down, I meet with you. That actual escort is still waiting for me outside that door. Does not leave me alone. Once I'm done with you, the door opens, I walk out. The escort walks me to reception. But when they walk me to reception, again, I'm seeing nothing. When they walk me to reception, they actually are going to look at my briefcase. They're going to look at my briefcase and see, did I take anything? What did I take that I should not have taken? They see I took nothing, 
and they let me go on my way. It's really a different way to think about things when you look at a traditional flat network versus, hey, I am going to look at and only allow you to connect to that which I'm going to allow you to connect to. And I will know if you've con- you have you can't even see anything to connect to anything but what I've allowed you to. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a good example. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we mentioned cybersecurity is huge. I mentioned our anxiety levels are now up. Now I just need psychiatrist Pam, uh, <laughs> which she is not a psychiatrist anybody, but anyway, Psychiatrist Pam. We need the cocktail for this one, right? Yeah, can you get those? Yeah, whatever the presses and the whatever. Um, uh, how 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 should listeners? You know, like I said, we've got companies small and large. How should listeners start to think about it to maybe perhaps start to lessen some of the anxiety? Yeah, listen, th- look at it this way: the sky is not falling. I don't want your th- listeners thinking that. Oh my God, it's doom and gloom of everything. What we want to do, though, is think about the fact that, hey, the sky is not falling, but the, the sky looks gray and it looks like it's possibly going to rain. So let's be ready for the rain. Right. It, it, it's it's not about is it going to rain or isn't it going to rain? It's when is it going to rain? Because mm-hmm. that's really what most organizations in in quite frankly, personally, people face. Right. So when you think about cybersecurity. It's taking a personal responsibility for it, and it should become our norm. I recently had a um, podcast. I, I do have a podcast uh, with Zscaler. It's called uh, Chance, uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Trust. Um, it's kind of a cool name. I, mm-hmm. I can't take credit for the name. I, one of my p- former peers, Lisa Lorenzen and Chris Jablonski, they actually, Chris is still here, but they came up with the name. I thought it was phenomenal. But Stacy, actually, the CISO of Voya Financial, she actually talks about how when she started changing her, the mindset in her organization, she had to make sure everyone understood it was everyone's responsibility to secure the organization, to secure the company, because ultimately they need to be secure. And another Zscaler CIO, uh, customer who's a CIO, he actually teaches his employees cyber safety for the home uh, based on the understanding that the employees will actually bring those same best practices to work. So it, it really is about, you know, education and understanding that we just need to make it everyday norm for us. Uh, so I think um, a lot of our users, um, a lot of companies, not it doesn't matter the market they're in, but are accessing information from the field. So, for example, our contractors are starting to take, you know, iPads and pet tablets, I mean, let alone their phones, but and, you know, accessing shop drawings and, you know, building drawings and all that stuff. So um, I, I guess, how does that, how do you think about that sort of thing too? Uh, you know, how, how should companies start to think about that? As those a- devices, yeah, those devices have to be secured. Let me give you an example. Um, and and most, most listening will know United Airlines, right? They're, they are a Zscaler customer. Um, they are very vocal and speak at a lot of events, relative to how they think about security, how they think about how Zscaler actually um, helps them detect and block threats for over 80,000 users working in over 350 locations around the world, right? It's, you know, think about this. I mean, I was just on a plane last night for four hours. I didn't think twice about cybersecurity at that moment. And I, here I am up in the air, 35, 38,000 feet in the air, um, understanding that they think about cybersecurity as embedded into what they do and how they actually go ahead and provide services to all of the tens of millions of that fly on United Airlines, right, globally. Another one, um, quite frankly, guaranteed rate. Some may know guaranteed rate. They adopted zero trust architecture in order actually to create a more secure and faster and great end user experience for over 6,000 users in about 50 branches. Um, you know, these are, these are companies that are looking to, it's about reputation. Let's face it. Somebody has a cyber breach. It hurts their company reputation. It's about securing their company, securing their end users, their customers. And these are some leading companies making incredible progress in this area of, of protection. Yeah. One of the, One of the examples you gave um, and that we've talked about, well, you know, we're all dealing with other people that are also online. And one of the things that uh, comes to mind uh, is like the supply chain, 
and I don't necessarily mean in our case or a distributor, but this is the supply chain that everyone works with. Like, so United, for example, deals with, you know, all kinds of people, you know, from manufacturer their plane to the janitorial service, whatever. Um, I think that's interesting. So I, uh, I don't know if you want to touch on like, so if I'm running a small contractor or a, a small university or whatever, the people I work with, the vendors are also bringing opening doors, uh, whether, whether, you know, probably not maliciously, they're just doing it to do business. Any, any subject things. So what I'm saying is it seems like I'm responsible for my company, but now I start working with you as a company. I somehow have to, I can't trust you necessarily cyber cyberly. <laughs> I don't know. Can you touch on that a little bit? Sure. No, no, it's a really important point that you bring up. Um, a couple of the latest breaches have actually happened that have been in the news have happened because of a third party, a third party contractor doing business with, um, you know, they thought their security posture was strong. It wasn't also, you know, one of the things in a traditional network, some organizations struggle with giving third parties the right kind of access securely to what they need to get to. And so some will give actually a third party VPNs of a VPN to get in, you know, an actual way to get in is by using VPN. Some will give them a VDI. But again, what you need to do with third parties is only give them the application they need, right? Only allow them to see the application, but you may not want them to download data you may not want them to be able to upload malicious data, but you may need them just to go ahead and do some keystrokes on, on a specific machine or for check a specific device, right? That an IOT device that may not be working right. And so in order to do that, why not do that in a way where you're just rendering pixels on a screen through browse, what is called usually is browser isolation, right? And being able to see what they have to see, do what they need to do, but not be able to impact your organization. So third parties have to be thought of very differently than we have in the past. And many organizations are doing just that. Because quite frankly, it's amazing when you look at some of these organizations and how many third parties, um, you know, B2Bs they actually use to bring products to market. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and as we get into a world where things are like supply chain is more transparent, we have to sh- we we want to share data because it's going to make us more efficient. But then that introduces potential problems. So, yeah, absolutely. Right. Let's start to think about the future a little bit again. Try to ease our anxieties a little bit. Um, can you can you talk a little bit? Imagine a world where cybersecurity is, I don't know if solved is the right thing because there's kind of always going to be crime, right? <laughs> but yep. where, where cybersecurity is a little bit more uh, secure, I don't know what the right word is. You can help me work through this question here. But yeah. what does what does the world look like when cybersecurity is a little bit more under control, if it even can be? I don't know. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think that's where when you look at the organizations monitoring the World Wide Web, trying to keep us all more and more secure because we're identifying um, real world in real time um, malicious activity. But it, but if, if it did get better, right, and we were able to live in that kind of world, it, it would really free up a lot of time and focus on using technology to really to enable the business and, and progress the build business, right? Rather than having to spend so much time and money and resources on defense, um, it, there's really no limit, I think, that what organizations could achieve. But realistically, uh, and, and for some, they may not want to hear this, but malicious and bad actors, this activity is, is just too big of a business to go away. And I think we just need to embed security into our everyday lives. So it's just part of what we do in order to be able to just do our thing. But if we keep embedding it, it'll become second nature to always take it into account. Okay. What what are maybe, how do we start to get to a place where it's a little we're spending a little less time and energy on it. Well, I, I, per, this is my personal opinion. I, I think it, it, it's about everyone taking responsibility. And we have to start at a young age. You know, cybersecurity should be taught in schools. W- w- let me give you an example. And this may be sound really silly, but even in my 50s, it just blows my mind. I have friends who on Facebook, they'll go ahead and literally get to a restaurant and check in. Say, at this restaurant, 
Okay, that's great for the restaurant, but that's now telling people you have left your house unoccupied. Or I just had some friends who, who posted pictures of the vacation they're on, currently on. Okay, hello. If you want to post your pictures, which I totally get about your beautiful vacation, wait till you get back. Do it when you get home and say, hey, we had a great time on vacation. Here's some photos of, of what we experienced, right? It's simple little things to start to secure yourself. And it's not big things, but you know, we, we've become so lackadaisical about where we are, what we're doing. People use that to try to go ahead and, and, and hurt you in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You're, you're so, especially if you're on some crazy vacation that you just really want to share. Yeah. You get that. Like, well, maybe just choose a couple of people and share it with them personally. Yeah. <laughs> I exactly. am the direct link and then go back. Um, so, all right. So how do our listeners start to apply the concept of zero trust to their business? Mm -hmm. So what everyone listening should do is they should ask their organization, what do we look, how are we looking at cybersecurity? Is there something we should be doing differently and, and, or what should we be thinking about? In addition, they should be asking because it's a, your organization that you're working for is a great place to start to say, what resources are available to me as an employee? of our company that can help build my understanding of cybersecurity and what should I be thinking about or doing differently, right? And for those organizations, in understanding some of the organizations listening, maybe smaller organizations, there are a lot of opportunities for you to learn more about this. Um, you know, you could go to our website, zscaler.com. There's so much information. We also have an area called the CXO Revolutionaries site, website. And this website, actually is for thought leaders. So if you are someone who is in charge of security at your organization, you could go to our CXO Revolutionaries website and learn more about what you should be thinking by other thought leaders. These are leaders in the industry. These are actual sometimes peers. They are people talking about what they are doing in their organizations or how they're looking at Zero Trust to do this differently than the traditional manner in which we did it before. And what are some of the things to think about when you're doing this? Yeah, so everybody, I will uh, link to that, uh, the Revolutionaries uh, site there. And also, there, I don't know about the other company, but United, there's a pretty good video uh, video or video series I watched on, your, on the site too that kind of goes into a little bit. I mean, it's pretty high level, but I give you some ideas about things to think about. Um, Certainly uh, networking with, you know, finding people that are thinking about this in, in your local area is good, mm -hmm. too. And I, like you go to that revolutionary site and seeing what's going on. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, you did mention this earlier, Cloudy with a Chance of Trust. Um, I do like the title a lot. I'm always <laughs> jealous of really good titles. Um, uh, maybe you kind of talked about this, but can you talk about briefly just what the focus is of it, the kind of guests you have on and, you know, where listeners can find it? Absolutely. So um, we really focus on really cyber topics, um, what people should be thinking about. You know, for instance, one of our actual episodes we had, and, and some may or may not know Dr. Ron Ross, he's, he's the NIST fellow. He actually helped build the NIST framework that a lot of organizations um, actually try to um, put controls in place. And those controls are, what should we be thinking about? How should we be thinking about cybersecurity relative to our organization? We'll have other, um, you know, industry experts, or I'll have peers on the show to talk about what did they find when they started changing? What were some of the gotchas when they started thinking about security differently, right? Because you don't know what you don't know when you start embarking on this, because we've all been doing the same thing for so long. Another, you know, another thing is I try to have, um, really like industry experts, CISOs, like Stacey Hughes. I had mentioned Stacey earlier about, you know, the CISO over at Voya Financial, who just people who are, I shouldn't say people, leaders who are actually going ahead and doing really bold things in their organization to be focused on security. Because ultimately, if they focus on security in their organization, it's actually securing all of you, their customers. And isn't it about securing the entire ecosystem? And you have to think outside the box to be able to do that, right? It's not just this myomic view of I'm going to secure my network. I have to secure my ecosystem and figure out how to do that effectively. 
one of the things I noticed as I was preparing for the conversation with you is just kind of how it is that, you know, it is, it's not just protecting the company's assets. It's really com- protecting the employees because a lot of things can happen to the employees as well. And I like the one you talked about the person training their people for the home um, because, you know, obviously I'm on the computer all the time at my house too, doing my, yeah. you know, doing whatever financial stuff and family stuff. So that that's really cool. And um, I assume the podcast can be found at where most podcasts are found and on the website and all that. And it's actually on CXO Revolutionaries. You can find it. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I like to close the conversations by refocusing on the why of what we do. So Pam, what motivates you to do this day in and day out? What keeps you excited and passionate about what you do? It's about people and organizations we help secure. When you actually look at the organization I came from, which I think dearly of, and, and it, you know, it really, it changes people's lives every day because it's a healthcare and medical device company. And when I saw how over seven years ago, we could change that culture, that the technology, how we could actually go ahead and solve business problems we couldn't in the past, enable the business to be more agile, flexible, and secure, right? Give our end users a great experience. Um, I love, I, it was, it was crazy. I took that and I actually, you know, came over to Zscaler because that was a technology that enabled most of that. And when I sit down and I talk, and I'm really in this role, I'm more of an advisor. I talk to others, peers, executives about what our former journey was, um, what were some of the challenges we were having, because sometimes you have to lay out the challenges you were trying to solve for, which I didn't realize, because I was not on a zero, Todd, I was not on a zero trust journey. Our organization wasn't. It was about being able to do things differently. Lack of funding, right? Because funding went into our, our products, You know, tech debt, um, end of life, end of support systems, users, apps being anywhere. How do you go ahead and start to secure all that? When I saw how we could do that differently, um, it just wanted me to come here and be able to help others see how possibly it could be done. One of the things I tell organizations, you know, it doesn't matter what your industry is. We did the same thing. What's unique to your industry? And what should be taken into account? And when I watch, I had a CIO uh, of a company the other day, and he was, the, the, a couple of the techs were going over some technology, and, and I didn't see the lights going off. And I, and I said, hold on, stop, Rob. I said, do you get this? He goes, no, I, I really don't. I said, okay, let me explain this to you. And because I'm not a deep technical person, right? I work for a tech company, it's great, but I'm not. And so when I explained it kind of in layman's terms, all of a sudden you saw the light bulbs go off. It's like, oh, no, I get it. So we have to do this, this, and this. I'm like, yes. It's those kind of days because every day, every conversation I have, <clears throat> that's why I love this job and I love this tech, because I watch the light bulbs go off in different organizations and different types of people and people all over the world. And it's really cool that when you look at this, um, you know, you can make a difference by having somebody understand how they can make a difference. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. I, well, I do like that um, the company Zscaler has brought in people like you to help do that, kind of hopefully help Zscaler understand what they can do because you've been in the user side, but then also you can help explain to users. I've noticed that in the contractor side of things, just software in general, not cybersecurity, they bringing in. Uh, industry professionals to help on, you know, it just makes better software and better, you know, better solutions. And in this one, it's critical to make a better solution. So, um, well, Pam, thank you so much for being here, taking the time with me and sharing some really cool, uh, some interesting concepts, kind of hopefully lessening our anxiety a bit um, and also introducing us to some cool food at the beginning. So um, it's been great to have you on the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. That was the conversation with Pam Kubiatowski, CTO and residence at Zscaler. You can now connect with Pam and what she's working on by heading to the links in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving a five-star rating in your favorite podcast player. And now you can catch us on YouTube as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of Keeping the Lights On. We'll see you next time.